What's up, everyone, and welcome back to Project X Talk. My name is Kevin, aka The Muffin Mon, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about two characters very dear to me, and that is Banjo Kazooie. My boy, right here, one of my favorite characters in gaming. I love, love their games. And I did the history of Crash Bandicoot a while ago, and 3D platformers are a genre I love. So I think this might be a recurring series. If you like, this deep dive into 3D platforming mascots, please hit the like button, subscribe for more content. And if you want this early, please head on over to patreon.com slash project X talk, subscribe at the $1, $1 a month tier, and you get all our videos early as soon as they are ready for upload. That could be weeks ahead of time in some cases. These videos take a lot of research and time, but without further ado, let's dive into the history of Banjo-Kazooie. Now, rare, at the time, known as Rareware, did not originally set out to create Banjo-Kazooie. The year was 1996, and Rare was Nintendo's golden child. A new project codenamed Project Dream was being devised by the Rare team. This would be a role-playing game, a far cry from the platformers that Rare was putting out. Originally designed for the SNES and later the N64, Dream, as it became known, would follow a young boy named Edson and his pets Dinger the Dog and Billy the Parrot as he was engaged in a conflict with pirates. Rare pirates. I see they uh, they kept that. But originally, starting with an isometric view, the switch to the N64 led the project to 3D. And due to the complexity, it was scaled back to a linear platforming game, much like Donkey Kong Country. Rare co-founder Tim Stamper decided to replace Edson with Banjo, who was already a minor character within Dream. The project was not progressing as expected, and within Rare, another team was hard at work at what we would know as Conker's Bad Fur Day, leading the project to be changed to a full-on platformer. At the same time, Super Mario 64 had just released and changed the landscape forever setting the standard for 3D platformers going forward, and the team in Rare backed Banjo, so it went into full production in March 1997. Greg Mails was the head designer for Banjo-Kazooie. However, despite Banjo originally being planned for Dream, Kazooie was not a part of the original design. Kazooie came about when during production of Banjo-Kazooie, they wanted to focus on Banjo being able to use abilities. The team wanted, quote, wings to appear from his backpack to help him double jump, and they wanted him to run fast with a second pair of legs. They eventually decided it would make sense if those came from a second character hidden within the existing backpack that Banjo's character already had. The bird character was given an annoying personality and the name Kazooie after a kazoo. This is how we get the iconic duo of Banjo and Kazooie. Dream was originally meant to release in 1997, However, after scrapping and retooling the project, Banjo-Kazooie required more time, and the game was delayed until the summer of 1998. Rare, however, wanted a game for holiday 1997, so shortly after Killer Instinct 2 was released, they began development on Diddy Kong Racing. Now, you may be asking why I bring up Diddy Kong Racing. Well, it's because Diddy Kong Racing would be the world's introduction to three iconic Rare characters, Conker and Banjo and Kazooie. Put in the game to give an introduction before their games came out, Banjo-Kazooie was a playable character along with Tip Tup, a turtle found in two worlds in the Banjo-Kazooie game. Banjo-Kazooie continued development and eventually saw multiplayer and more worlds cut due to time constraints. But on June 29th, 1998, Banjo-Kazooie was released in the United States and received critical acclaim with journalists highlighting the graphics, sound effects, and gameplay elements, with some holding it in higher regard than Super Mario 64. However, one of the most iconic aspects of Banjo-Kazooie that has stood the test of time is the legendary score from Grant Kirkhope. Grant worked on many soundtracks from Rare, and you probably know some of them, but perhaps none more memorable than Banjo-Kazooie's original soundtrack. And if I could put in a track from Spiral Mountain or Gruntilda's Lair right here, I would, but copyright strikes don't make for good content. Banjo-Kazooie, the original game, put you in the roles of the titular characters as they try to rescue Banjo's sister Tootie from the evil witch Gruntilda. Banjo features a hub world much like Crash Bandicoot, where you enter themed environments and in those environments explore, collect puzzle pieces, which would become the iconic Jiggies, and then use those to gain access to other worlds. 
Throughout the journey, you'll have boss fights and puzzles, and you gain abilities such as the ability to shoot eggs out of Kazooie and fly. It's simplistic in nature, but executed to perfection. Following strong sales and critical reception, a sequel for Banjo Kazooie entered production in June of 1998. Integrating features that were previously cut, such as multiplayer, would be put in the sequel so up to four players could compete in mini games. Additionally, multiplayer game modes that were planned included the second player being able to control a boss during boss fights. And then if you won, you get to take control of Banjo and play from there. Kind of a switch back and forth type thing. But unfortunately, this was not added. Rare also wanted to implement something they would call stop and swap, where you'd be able to transfer data from Banjo-Kazooie to Banjo-Tooie, which is the sequel's name, to unlock additional features, but the N64 simply couldn't handle this. Banjo-Tooie was released in November of 2000, and much like its predecessor, released to critical acclaim, sold more than 3 million copies worldwide, and while I may personally prefer the original, there's no doubt Rare took what it learned from the first and built upon it. The sequel saw Banjo-Kazooie taking on Gruntilda and her two sisters two years after the events of the original game. One thing that Tui does that even games to this day don't do is that Banjo-Kazooie had access to every ability they had in the previous game at the start of this one. We often see games where they make you recollect abilities, sequels to games where you just learn everything you had just had in the previous game. Banjo-Tooie didn't make you do this. The sequel did see a change to the hub world, uh, but overall, the gameplay loop remained the same. Collect jiggies, unlock worlds, defeat the bad guys. Despite their extensive relationship with Nintendo, the rising cost of game development could not be ignored by the executives of Rare. Wishing to be purchased by Nintendo, but not having that wish granted, Rare started looking for potential buyers during the same time Banjo-Tooie was finishing up development. Microsoft ultimately won a bidding war, which actually included Activision, which has just been acquired or is in the process of being acquired by Microsoft, and purchased Rare for $375 million dollars on September 24th, 2002. Rare would now be a first-party developer for Microsoft's Xbox console, and along with the studio came the IP Rare created like Conker and, of course, Banjo-Kazooie. However, Microsoft's acquisition of Rare did not stop Rare from working with Nintendo or slow down Banjo-Kazooie's momentum. While Microsoft wanted Rare to make console games for Xbox, they had no stake in the handheld market, a market dominated by Nintendo's Game Boy. Microsoft had no problem with Rare continuing to make games for Nintendo's popular handheld. However, these games wouldn't be published by Microsoft. Instead, they struck a deal with THQ to publish two Banjo-Kazooie games. The two games published by THQ would be known as Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot. Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge was released in 2003, but development of the game began in August 1999 and was originally set to be on the Game Boy Color, but Rare were unable to bring their vision to light on that hardware. Despite being the third Banjo game, this game actually takes place between the events of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. This time around, Gruntilda travels back through time to stop the events of Banjo-Kazooie from happening. However, the original title of this game was Grunty's Curse, and was set in a parallel universe. The story was changed to time travel, and the interesting thing about this game is that instead of being a 3D platformer, it's a 2D game. Perhaps due to the limitations of the Game Boy Advance, this game is still a platforming collectathon with an emphasis on abilities, but I can't help but feel it was held back by the hardware it was on. Despite this, the game released to mix and average reviews, with critics criticizing the story and the shortness of the game. The title was ported to smartphones in 2005, and I'm unsure if it's still playable on such. Uh, you can look in the App Store, but who knows. The second and final Banjo game released on Nintendo platforms would be 2005's Banjo Pilot for the Game Boy Advance. Banjo Pilot is a kart racer where you fly airplanes instead of driving carts. But in most aspects, it's pretty similar to Mario Kart. The title began development as a sequel to Diddy Kong Racing, which we actually talked about earlier in this video, and it was even called Diddy Kong Pilot. Diddy Kong Pilot was aiming for a March 2002 release and was even unveiled at E3 2001, 
but Nintendo became concerned with the quality and the fact that it was using airplanes instead of carts, so they delayed the title indefinitely. After Rare was acquired by Microsoft, Nintendo returned due to a successful Donkey Kong Country port that Rare did for them and asked them to finish the title. But with Banjo IP attached instead of Diddy Kong because they owned Banjo and Nintendo owned Diddy Kong. Much like the last title, it was released to average reviews and critics did not feel it translated well or compared to Mario Kart. So guys, we've covered the history, the inception of Banjo, his, his, his good games. Now I have to emotionally brace myself and prepare myself to talk about what I consider to be the worst Banjo game ever made. I genuinely like every other Banjo game we've discussed before this, but it's time we dive into the game that, in my opinion, killed Banjo-Kazooie, and that is Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. Released in November 2008 for the Xbox 360, this marked Banjo's return to a home console in nearly a decade. According to Greg Mails, Rare's initial idea was to remake Banjo-Kazooie for the Xbox 360, but they didn't want to retread old ground. Instead, the team wanted to make a game where you could build stuff, like an interactive Lego set. This would set the groundwork for Nuts and Bolts. Taking place eight years after Banjo-Tooie, Gruntilda tries to take over Spiral Mountain, but instead of platforming, the titular heroes fight back by completing vehicle-based challenges. The gameplay revolves around building vehicles like cars, boats, and planes, and while not abandoning platforming altogether because you can grab ledges and go swimming, this is a far cry from the Banjo-Kazooie of old. Gone are the abilities that we saw in previous Banjo titles, and while we still see a hub world, the gameplay loop is very different. You have to collect vehicle parts and blueprints throughout the world and by completing different challenges. The game featured an online multiplayer mode where you could race other people. The only thing that this game actually did was introduce the stop and swap feature that Rare wanted so long ago, where if you played the Xbox Live arcade version of Banjo-Kazooie, you could actually get unlockables in this title. Despite my disdain, the game was received well enough. However, if you haven't noticed, one of the main criticisms from fans and critics was the redesign of Banjo-Kazooie, which I am no doubtably showing you on the screen right now. The characters were redesigned, and in my opinion, it's horrifying. Gone is the gentle nature of Banjo, who now gives off a cocky vibe, along with darker fur. Kazooie is all glammed up, wearing tons of eyeliner, and I just don't like this look at all. I understand the 360 was more powerful, but there's something to be said that the original design holds up incredibly well and should have just been translated to this new console. Eventually, all three mainline Banjo titles were re-released for the Xbox One consoles as part of Rare Replay, a collection of Rare's greatest hits. Rare Replay was released in 2015 for the Xbox One. However, no new Banjo game has been seen in nearly 14 years. Despite not having a new game in a decade and a half, Banjo-Kazooie has not been quiet. It's maintained a strong fan base, especially amongst those that grew up with the character on the N64. The fan base was so strong, Banjo-Kazooie had been consistently one of the most requested characters to join the fight in Super Smash Bros. These requests have been flooding in since Melee, Sakurai said. However, as the Banjo IP was owned by Microsoft since 2002, the fans were not hopeful. While Super Smash Bros. Brawl introduced third-party characters with Sonic and Snake, it wasn't until Smash 4 where we saw the floodgates for third-party open up. Characters like Mega Man, Bayonetta, and more were joining the roster, but Banjo hadn't had a game in six years when Smash 4 came out. By the time Ultimate's DLC was released in 2019, fans thought it was unlikely a character from a dead franchise would make it. And yet, E3 2019... Rumors were abound that Banjo was going to be announced as DLC for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Nintendo's E3 Direct began, and Banjo fans everywhere were disappointed when they saw a trailer revealing Hero from Dragon Quest was going to be the next fighter for Smash. However, at the end of the Direct, another Smash reveal appeared, and this time we headed to Donkey Kong's house. He was sleeping with Diddy Kong, and I can still picture the trailer so clearly. I can feel my excitement, and it still gets chills. He was sleeping with Diddy and K. Rule, and we see a jiggy bounce across the screen. 
I can say at least I screamed and jumped for joy when I saw the Jiggy go. I could not believe it. Banjo Kazooie eventually dropped down from the sky, raring to go, as they said. And even DK, Diddy, and K. Rule were thrilled to see him finally show up. Banjo Kazooie joined Super Smash Bros. Ultimate in Challenger Pack 3, and I couldn't be happier. What does this mean? Was a new Banjo game coming? Banjo's design was new and modern, but kept his original design. Sakurai and the team did a fantastic job updating him for modern consoles. But as of now, no new Banjo game has been announced, despite Xbox fans calling for it. With Xbox needing family-friendly games and the resurgence of 3D platformers, now, and I mean it, now is the time to bring back the bear and the bird.